Okay, this is uh, Freedom From Government, and this is The Court Show, Part 2. And we're going to discuss going to court, how to go to court, and what you can expect when you go to court. Because going to court and learning the law is going to be a requirement if you're going to challenge the authority of agents for the government. So this is what they would like you to believe. It's not true, of course, but this is what it, they say is true. It's an adversarial system. That means if you're the defendant and the uh, government is suing you, then you have to defend yourself and it's between you and the district attorney. You're the adversaries. The judge is not your adversary, but when you get to court, you'll soon find out that the judge is your real adversary because the district attorney is never going to say anything other than present paper to the judge and the judge is going to do all the questioning of you and try to get you to admit to things. So the first thing I want you to think about is, who is the party that's suing you? When you look on the paper, it's going to say the people of the state of whatever. But it's not really them, it's the district attorney that's suing you. So, is the person that's suing you your accuser? Do you have a right to face your accuser? And are they real or are they fictional? I mean, can I get the name and address to serve a subpoena on the plaintiff to come and testify? Can I? The purpose of the court is to establish facts and law and make those facts and law coincide with each other to end up convicting you. So their whole purpose is to get evidence into the record that there are facts and law that you're liable for. So your job is going to be able to show that they don't have any jurisdiction over you and that they're committing fraud in their attempt to claim that they have the right to create facts and law that you're liable for, unless you are liable for them. You're always going to be liable for common law crimes. If you cause a personal injury or loss to another living soul, you are going to pay for it. So there are only two things that will void any judgment. One of them is lack of jurisdiction on the court's part. If you can show the court doesn't have any jurisdiction, the judgment will be void. The other thing is fraud. If you can show that there's fraud involved in the decision to get you convicted, it's void. So what is a crime? I'm going to read from a California decision here. In every criminal trial, the prosecution must prove the corpus delecti, or the body of the crime itself, i.e., the fact of injury, loss, or harm, and the existence of a criminal agency as its cause. And that's from People versus Alvarez in 2002. Okay, so can a fictional entity prove that you, they were caused a personal injury? Personal means it's real. You know, a living soul, a man or woman, was caused a personal injury or loss. If it's a fiction, fictions can't suffer a loss. The state of California can't suffer a personal injury or loss. And under uh, the California Code of Civil Procedure <clears throat> in 1916, grounds for impeachment of the judgment. Any judicial record may be impeached, that means made null and void, by evidence of a want of jurisdiction in the court, or judicial officer, or collusion between the parties, or of fraud in the party offering the record. To give you an idea what are the required elements, here under the Civil Code of 1572 in California, actual fraud, the suggestion as a fact of that which is not true by one who does not believe it to be true. Two, the positive assertion in a manner not warranted by the information of the person making it of that which is not true, though he believes it to be true. Three, the suppression of that which is true by one having knowledge or belief of the fact. Four, a promise made without any intention of performing it, or, five, any other act fitted to deceive. So if somebody's lying to you to get you to part with value, and that's going to be cause you a detriment, that's fraud. So you can stop these pages and just read each of the things that's mentioned in there and get an idea of these are actual court cases and they're, what they're saying is true and correct, and you can add them in your paperwork. So the best way to get an education on how to go to court and learn the law and proper procedure in serving all the parties and the procedural elements of going to court and facing off against a judge by fighting a traffic ticket. Sir Richard MacDonald used to love having his protégés fight traffic tickets to learn all of the aspects of going to court. And I think it's a great way to get started. 
Of course, it's going to take time for you to invest in doing this, but it's going to be well worth it. There's a lot of stuff you can do at the traffic stop, but let's just say the cop comes up and asks you to sign the ticket because you gave him the license and everything, and you're going to ask him what will happen if I don't sign this ticket, and he'll say I'm going to take you to jail. So you sign the ticket under threat and duress as beneficiary, B-E-N. You're not going to have to appear for at least probably 90 days. You're going to go down a couple weeks after you get the ticket, three weeks after you get the ticket, and ask to see the clerk and get a copy of what's in the file because you want a copy of the docket to see if there was a warrant issued. And you want to get a copy of it so you can prove that there was no warrant issued. Whatever you do, don't allow them to take you to jail. Sign the ticket, whatever they want, and because once you're taken to jail, you'll be held in jail unless you bail out, and unless you bail out, you're not going to be able to write any paperwork. So you're going to be put in a position where you can't really fight them. So don't get hauled off to jail. So the first paperwork I would enter into the court case is this notice and demand for abatement. You're going to want the court to drop these charges against you. I would do an abatement and I would list all the reasons why the court doesn't have any jurisdiction and you have no liability to the court. If they want to continue on, they're going to be using fraud and hearsay to convict you. The next document you're going to enter is a Brady motion for discovery and as Sir Richard McDonald used to say, California's rules on not, def not giving discovery are severe. If they don't give you discovery after you've asked for it, and if you don't get it within, you know, 10 days, send a second one in. Now you've got two demands for um, discovery, and they haven't provided it. You're going to serve this on the district attorney, who is supposed to be the prosecutor, but in California, in traffic court, there is no prosecutor. The district attorney is just going to ignore this. But you can prove that you gave it to him, and then you do a proof of service, you gave him a copy, and then you go and put your Brady motion into the record. They might refuse to accept your uh, Brady motion for discovery, but just leave it on the table there. You served them. You got a proof of service showing you served them. Whenever I serve the district attorney, I get him the clerk to file stamp the back page or something just to prove that I was there and they received it at such and such a time on such and such a day. The next thing I would do would be put in a 1538 motion to suppress evidence because if there was no warrant, then all of the evidence that the traffic cop collected at the stop is inadmissible. He can't talk about anything that happened there because he didn't have a warrant. And he can't say that you have a driver's license, that you answered questions, whatever. He can't do anything because there's no evidence anymore. So if you're not prepared, you can always go down to the court and ask for a continuance. And they'll automatically give you at least one continuance, usually for like 90 days or something, whatever. And then you can get ready. But once you go to trial, what's going to happen is the uh, judge is going to call up the cop who arrested you. And he's going to be the only one who testifies. He's going to swear himself in. And he's going to recite what he did at the traffic stop and why you should be uh, pay for the ticket you got. So the judge has to rely on evidence, and evidence is what is stated in court. Unless he admits something into evidence, and since there's no prosecutor to say, hey, I want this document entered into evidence, he can't enter it into evidence himself. So he has to have the cop get on the stand and swear himself in and testify. Without the cop's testimony, he can't convict you. What does that tell you about paperwork? The ticket would be, you, he could convict you on the ticket if all he needed was a paper, and you put in paper, they put in paper, and then he doesn't know what to do. But since he has the cop's testimony, he can rule in favor of that. If you don't testify, he can't, there's no opposing evidence in the record. The only thing you can do at that point is defeat the cop's testimony by proving that he's incompetent to testify. Now, if you don't subpoena somebody... You can't ask them questions about whatever you want. You can only cross-examine them on what they said. So, if a cop's testifying, he's going to have to read the charges against you, and then they're going to have to have terms like driving, a motor vehicle, etc. And you can ask him for those definition of terms, and if he can't give you the proper ones, then you can show him that he's incompetent to testify. And since nobody in California has the proper oath of office under Section uh, 3 of Title 20, you can ask, subpoena him and ask him to bring his oath of office and explain how it complies with the Constitution. And he may decide not to show up.
And just to prove to you that getting an attorney is not going to help you because the attorney is an agent of the court. And if you have an attorney, you're going to be perceived as being incompetent to handle your own affairs. And people that are incompetent have no rights. People that are insane, people that are underage, they don't have any rights. So here's the proof. Wards of the courts. Infants and persons of unsound mind. Yep. And what do you get if you get an attorney client? You're a ward of the court. I am not a pro se. I am not pro per. I am myself. So you look at the first Congress, the Judicial Act of 1789, Section 35, and be it further enacted that in the courts of the United States the parties may plead and manage their own causes personally, or by the assistance of such counsel or attorneys at law. So they knew the difference between attorneys at law and counsel, and you have a right to counsel. It doesn't say in the Constitution you have a right to an attorney at law. So a delegate, an agent and a representative all mean the same thing. You're acting on behalf of somebody else. So if you're pro se and you're representing yourself or you're representing the defendant, that's a lie. The court only sees dead people, fictions, and so they need you to speak for that dead entity that is the defendant. Now let's talk about misdemeanors and felonies. You're being charged with a crime. If you get charged with a crime, you're going to have to go to court and you're going to face the judge for the first time, usually, and it's going to be an arraignment. At the arraignment, they're going to ask you four questions. The four questions are, you know, are you going to answer to the name? They call the name, you stand up and go forward, so you're agreeing that you are the defendant, number one. Number two, they're going to ask you, uh, they're going to tell you what the charges are, only they're not going to actually read the charge into the record unless you ask them to. Number three, they're going to ask, are you going to represent yourself or are you going to get an attorney? And if you want one, we will appoint a public defender for you. And the fourth question is, how do you plead? Guilty or not guilty or no contest? So if you're getting arrested for a crime, there's only two ways this can go about. You got arrested at the scene because you got hooked up and taken to jail or... They decided to charge you and sent you a summons claiming that you were going to be charged with a misdemeanor or felony. If they sent you a summons, then you can start writing paperwork from home. If they hooked you up and took you to jail, I recommend bailing out. If it was some BS charge like resisting arrest, you might wait 12 hours and see if they're going to charge you or release you. Because they may not charge you if they don't have a good enough case. And the reason you want to do this is once you bail out, they'll set your next hearing, but it won't be for like 30 days or something. So you have plenty of time to write paperwork prior to the arraignment. You don't want to be stuck going to the arraignment immediately. The next big theory in court, the doctrine, is going to be hearsay. Hearsay is what the courts are built on. I mean, everything about a court is built on hearsay. The only thing real is if you're going to trial and somebody's testifying based on first-hand knowledge. If you'd put anything into the record, if you put a piece of paper into the record, you can say that I have first-hand knowledge. I wrote it. I, that's my signature on it. But none of the paperwork they're going to have is on, based on first-hand knowledge. The cop that uh, writes up the charges then gives it to the district attorney, and the district attorney makes the complaint. She doesn't know what happened. It's hearsay. And there's a good Supreme Court case on that called Kalina versus Fletcher, where they actually say, you know, look, the attorney, district attorney is asking for a warrant based on probable cause that this happened. And they said, well, the attorney's not claiming that she was there and witnessed it, so she can't write an affidavit asking for a warrant. Brilliant. Now you can win by using statutory pleadings. All of the codes are public policy. All of the court, uh, Congress's uh, public laws are public policy. And what's public policy? Well, if you've worked at Walmart, does Walmart have po policy of their own? Absolutely. Policy isn't law, it's public policy. Public means government, by the way. Anytime you see the word public, it means government, body politic. So what you're doing here is creating a public policy as the employer's guidelines for its employees. Who are the employees? All the agents of government. They're also trustees. And they are bound to follow the Constitution. 
but it's all the public policy also applies to them because it's their employer. So I always state in my documents, I'm not subject to the codes. However, I'm putting them in my paperwork because the agents of government are subject to those codes. They have an oath of office and they're subject to the codes because it's a contract. So they're contractually subject to those codes. So I always claim in my writing I'm one of the people because the people are sovereign and there's all these court cases that prove it. What's sovereign? If you don't understand sovereignty, then you're going to be missing out because the states and the federal government like to claim that they're sovereign. But they aren't sovereign. They can't be sovereign. No imaginary friend of yours is got power over you as the king. And that's what a sovereign is, a king. It means that there's no higher power. That's the definition. The sovereign makes the law and is not subject to the law. So guess what? The problem is, is that everybody is sovereign, which means you live in a world where all of your neighbors are equal. They're not higher. They're not lower. It's all about status. If you're not higher or lower than somebody and everybody's equal, this, they tried to impose that equality in the Constitution when they said there's no titles of nobility. What's a title of nobility? That's some special privilege you got that other people don't have. That means there's a difference in your status and it's recognizable by your title, Esquire. So anybody who's ever been to court realizes really quickly that somehow you are viewed as a slave. When you ask the judge questions, he doesn't answer you or will give you uh, answers that aren't conclusive. And when you ask him a second time, he'll hold you in contempt. So why does he have an authority to hold you in contempt for asking a question? You have a First Amendment right to free speech and you certainly have a right to ask the questions of what makes me liable here. And yet he will act like you don't have that right, which is fraud, because he has a moral duty to speak, a moral duty to explain why you're liable. And the fact is, is that let's say he's operating on some form of trust and he sees you as not the party. But if you start speaking for the party, then you're acting as a trustee of the trust and then he can do things because trustees can be sent to jail. They're liable. Beneficiaries are not. The beneficiary can't be harmed. So you want to get into equity, but you get into equity by actually losing at common law first and not having a remedy in common law or proving that there's a trust or a fraud involved. And here are some stuff to look at and research to see how you can get into equity in your case. Even if you str jump straight into saying you're the beneficiary and you want to be in equity, you still are better off proving that there's no uh, subject matter jurisdiction, the court has no jurisdiction, there's a whole bunch of defects in their court case, they're committing fraud. You want to bring up all of your reasons why you're not liable for these charges. And you want to show cause that you have these rights. And so to just ignore uh, doing all the common law points of, you know, is there subject matter jurisdiction here? You know, am I a driver of a motor vehicle or am I the uh, grantor of this mortgage deed trust? Oftentimes, if you're in equity, the judge will ask all the parties back into chambers. Now, the difference between being in chambers and being in the courtroom is in chambers, it's private. In the courtroom, it's public. So everything you're doing in chambers is private. And if you have a trust that's private, you never reveal it in the record because that would make it public. So you can show the judge a trust that you have, but it'll be in chambers only and not put for public record. So let's look at creating our own private living estate trust. And then we're going to dump all of our titles and properties and deeds into that trust. So uh, if somebody goes to court and they're talking about your car or they're talking about your house or whatever they're talking about, it's in a trust. So it's foreign because it's foreign to the uh, Washington District of Columbia. That's it. It's just foreign to the government. It's a private trust because it's not going to be registered in the public and it's not statutory and it doesn't have to be approved and shown to the public. What you're looking at here is the indenture for the trust and every trust needs an indenture. That's a set of rules that have to be governed. 
if you don't put things in that count, there can be a problem because the trustee has to know what to do and you have to show him what his limitations are and what his authority is. And uh, if you don't feel confident that you're going to do a good job with this, then maybe you ought to make it a revocable trust, which means that you can shut it down at any time you want and change it with a new one. If you make an irrevocable trust, that is where it's irrevocable and like if the IRS is coming after you and saying that you owe them a ton of money and you have an irrevocable trust, you can say you can't take my property because it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the beneficiaries and they will back off if you have an irrevocable. If it's a revocable trust, a living estate trust that's revocable, they can take the property because according to them, you still have control over it and you can sell it, which is true. So, it has to be irrevocable if you want to protect it. But, if you don't have it set up correctly, it could be a problem for you. So, the highest form of ownership is a lodial title. And in this country, it's fee simple is a lodial. You have the highest form of title. And this is from Bouvier's Law Dictionary, page 132. So, here's an example of doing a t transfer through a conveyance of the deed or title to the car to first the owner, the new owner, and then to the trust. Bunny Speakman notes that if you don't do an acceptance of the title transfer, the title hasn't completely transferred. So it's a requirement that you make a Schedule A list of the properties that are in the trust because a trust is always about the transferring of properties. If there's no tr properties being transferred, it's not really a trust. So this property list is going to be all the things that you own that you're putting into the trust. You don't have to put everything into a trust, but you want to make a list of what you're putting into the trust, and it should be specific. The next thing I want to talk about is doing a notice of liability. And here you can see on um, Cornell Law's site, they, can, they say the counter offer basically nullifies the original offer. Great. And it's a business. You have a right to contract, and in contracting, you can put a counter offer in. So you should pause this and read it over. Because each of the claims is worthwhile reading. You have to understand what you're doing here. Since I'm going to call everything's an offer. Because if it's not an offer, then you're practicing slavery. He's telling me I'm subject to your will, even though I haven't harmed anybody. Okay, I'm going to send you, the person who issues me the offer, uh, this counter offer, And I'm going to say, these are the terms of the counter offer. You have three options. One... You're going to rescind your offer in writing. Two, you're going to show cause that with offers of proof that you can make the claims you did by countering each of my claims, because each of my claims is going to make your claim defective. And number three, you can do nothing and remain silent, and then you're going to owe me a million dollars, because you are making an accusation here and you're committing fraud by telling you that I'm liable for whatever this offer is that you're sending me. And I'm proving that I don't have any liability for this statement that you sent me. I'm going to use two adult witnesses. They're going to witness my sworn statement on the uh, affidavit that is the notice of liability. And then they're, if they're going to be the ones that are the receivers of any responses through email. And they're at the end of a three weeks time period, they are going to be in default. But I'm going to give them a second opportunity to cure their default and their dishonor by giving them grace another three weeks to uh, respond in case they just made a mistake and didn't get it the first time. They're going to, the two adult witnesses are going to sign a statement that they received no response within the three weeks. And then I'm going to give them the notice of uh, grace. That's a notice of fault, NOF. And they're going to get another three weeks. And then at the end of that time period, the two adult witnesses and myself are going to sign a sworn uh, affidavit statement saying that no, re no responses were received to my affidavit. And as an assembly of three, we're issuing a certificate of default. And after the certificate of default is done, I do the notice of default, the default, the certificate of default, and a uh, notice of a true bill in commerce. And I send them a bill for a million dollars to all the parties named. You want to name all the living souls, the real men and women 
that are the CEOs of the company that's sending you this or whatever. And you're going to look up online and find out where you can find them, and then you're going to find out where you can mail them at if they have a registered agent for service of process because they're a corporation. And if they have a fax number and email, that's great because I like to serve them twice, once through uh, mail and once through uh, electronic delivery. That way they have less of a leg to stand on if they're going to say, well, I never got it. So the second document you're going to send is a notice of fault and opportunity to cure. You're going to give them a second chance in case they didn't get the first one, decided not to do anything and forgot about it, whatever, you're just being nice. Second opportunity to cure. It's going to show an affidavit from the two witnesses that they failed to receive any response from the principals and respondents. And that's going to let them know that you know that they're in default and that they failed to receive a response. So this is airtight. You have two people that aren't you that are making a claim that they didn't have any factual evidence that the other parties responded, so they're defaulting. This is the setup for doing the final default and sending them a true bill for a million dollars. The notice of liability is extremely powerful, and if you watch Cal Washington on YouTube talk about it, it's uh, it's impressive. That's, I highly recommend doing this, but I would not do this unless you have already done some foundational documents establishing your condition as being a, a state citizen and you know other things you've done, going to court and winning. When they look at you as to whether you're somebody to be tangled with, if you can go to court on your own, don't have to pay for an attorney, and defend yourself and win, that's when they start to get a little scared of you as being a tar baby. So after their time is up on the notice of fault, you're, you have sent them a notice of liability, a notice of fault, now it's time for a notice of default. So this is going to be the notice of default and certificate of default. You're going to have your witnesses again state that they haven't received any response for the notice of fault and identify when it was sent and um, who the parties are. And then you're going to do the certificate of default and then you're going to do the bill, true bill in commerce. And if you look up the definition of lien from Bouvier's, liens are really generated from contracts. It's a breach of contract. You know, we entered into a con contract, you took my product. And whatever you did with it, I have a lien right against that product because you didn't pay me. So I'm not doing a lien with this, although you could. I'm just doing the bill. And after proof that you didn't pay the bill, then you're basically a debtor and I'm the creditor because you didn't live up to your agreement on the contract. The great thing about it is because you're doing an affidavit and you're requiring them to swear an affidavit in return, if they're not going to object that you're stating that there's no contract between us and they didn't object to it, then they agreed that, yeah, there is no contract between us. They, that you committed mail fraud when you sent me a demand for this much money and I demanded that you prove, show proof of claim or show cause that I had a debt to you and you didn't dispute that. You didn't dispute that you committed mail fraud because you didn't answer that. So you're going to get a lot of uh, claims made on your part that they're not disputing. Okay, here's some case sites and definitions from the Law Dictionary showing that acquiescence is real and the whole government runs on acquiescence. Every time they send you a bill and you don't send them a letter disputing and objecting to it and making them show cause that it's you have a liability for it, you acquiesce to it, which means you're okay with it. And if you read this definition of delegation, a delegate can't delegate. Well, all the people that work in government are representatives, agents, delegates. It all means the same thing. Who's the principal? You are. You're the people. You're the principal. They're the agent. And yet, an agent can't give their job to somebody else. So when the, it's Congress's job to coin money, it can't give it to the Federal Reserve. They can't create agencies. All the three-letter agencies, those are creations of the government, and a delegate can't delegate to somebody else, so that's how that works. So let's do a little recap now. You're going to learn how to go to court. You're going to file your paperwork correctly, and if the first thing you're going to do right out of the gate is challenge the jurisdiction of the court and make them show cause they have it. They're not going to give you anything back showing where their authority and where their jurisdiction comes from, 
So after you know you get uh, you, you default them on show and cause, then send a letter to the appellate court and ask for a writ of prohibition, where you're going to ask the appellate court, the higher court, to shut down the lower court and stop it proceeding because until they show jurisdiction, they don't have any right to proceed. They're probably going to deny your prohibition, but these are the things you make a record of. Everything you do is making a record. There are lots of ways that the government <coughs> messes with the people. You know, it's CPS taking your children or the IRS sending you nasty grams or your local county telling you you can't put a window in your wall or whatever. So, these are some of the ways you can deal with that. Notice of liability does pretty good at dealing with all the letters from government agencies making a claim against you and uh, going to court, you're going to have to learn how to do that. Here's an example of the four-page uh, statement that I have typed up to hand out to law enforcement officers who pull me over because traffic stops are a very common interaction with the government. Most people have them regardless of whether they're having problems with the government or not. They're going to get traffic tickets occasionally. And if you got a run-down car or something like that, you're going to get pulled over all the time. You know that. So anyway, this is the four-page explanatory statement that I, that I give them to show them that once I've notified them what the definitions are, if they use the terms that I'm a driver and a motor vehicle without any evidence that I'm for hire at that time, they've committed a misdemeanor under Penal Code 118.1 because they put knowingly put false information into a police report. In addition to this uh, four-page explanatory, explanatory statement that I would give the police. I would also add my active state, which is the uh, picture ID with all my claims on it and the eight pages substantiating those claims, the Exhibit 1. And I would put in my letter from the DMV showing that I revoked and canceled and terminated the license uh, t a dozen years ago. And I would put in a uh, the letter from the DOJ sh showing that it's a um, misdemeanor felony to violate any of my constitutional rights. So it's my hope that this video and the previous one have been useful for you and shown you some things you can do to help you on your way to challenging the authority of the government. There's all kinds of things I've done and I could do videos for you know days and days if I wanted to with all the little e exciting escapades that I've uh, participated in but just to leave it at this you know I don't like long-winded videos and I hope and I'm pretty sure you don't either so I'm trying to condense this down to just showing some stuff that is doable and the reasoning behind it I hope you're well and I hope you have good luck on your adventures peace out